Number 10, Goku. This fight was non canon but has been the focus of more than one death battle video. Unfortunately, the odds of this happening in the pages of a comic or a manga seem slim, but hey, you never know. The only reason I'm actually ranking this one solo though is because of its non canon status. Because who wouldn't want to watch a fight and see Superman triumph over Goku at the very, very end? We all assume these two would have a great fight as they seem so evenly matched, both being from very strong alien races and almost the last of their kind. Goku got bested both times due to his desire to keep it a fair fight. In one of the death battle videos, Goku actually could have won if he had decided to use kryptonite, but he kind of felt like it was cheating, so want want, you lose. Goku just wants to win on brute strength alone. It's all about the power levels. Oh boy, this is gonna be fun. You're insane. Number 9, The Elite. This entire team of anti heroes got Superman's attention after they started dispatching villains in a brutal and violent way, even killing them. Superman, being very anti violence, disagreed with their methods and told them to stop it. But their leader, Manchester Black, a powerful telekinetic, refused, laughing in Superman's face. Much to Kal Al's dismay, the team also seemed to be gaining popularity among civilians. The team and Superman eventually came to blows, and just as they thought they had won and defeated him and potentially killed him, him, Superman reappeared and seemed to hang up his morals momentarily in order to kill them all. The whole battle had been filmed and broadcast, so Manchester Black at least was able to declare that this proved that Superman was no better than they were. He was actually the only one left alive at the end, although Superman did apparently zap his powers away from him. But Superman once again managed to turn the tables on the elite, revealing that he hadn't actually killed anyone, he just knocked out Manchester Black's teammates. And that his zapping of Manchester Black's powers was actually temporary and he would eventually recover. So, yeah. Number eight, Flash. On the alternate Earth 2, Darkseid managed to create a clone of Kal El, which appeared to possess almost all of the original Kal El's memories, actually. This version of Superman was known as Brutal, and while Superman often struggles to win against the Flash in the main continuity, this version of Superman both outran the Flash and managed to catch him. Even worse, he aimed to stop Jason Garrick, Earth 2's current Flash, from running away from him by crippling one of his legs. Ouch. Number 7, Maxima. Based off of a similar interaction from the comics, Maxima of the royal house of the planet Almarac offered herself to Superman in the Superman animated series. She told him that they were a perfect genetic match, and promised that if he was able to best her in combat, she would wed him. He told her that he wasn't interested, which caused her to start a fight with him. He did end up defeating her, but this only strengthened her attraction to him more. Delighted she had finally found someone who she deemed her equal. He beat her, but then she kidnapped him. Cause that's what you do, I guess, when you're in love with someone. One, and they beat you in combat. Number six, Batman. Usually Batman is the one that beats Superman. Despite not having superpowers himself, he is pretty much always prepared going into battle with Superman, or with anyone for that matter. It's his superior planning skills and ability to be prepared for any outcome that always gives Batman the upper hand, usually or in the edge in a battle. But what happens when Batman is without this skill? In the Justice League origin storyline from the New 52, we get to see what happens when Batman and Superman fight for the first time. Without Batman's extensive knowledge of Superman, he is left insanely vulnerable to the superpowered Cal. Green Lantern even attempts to help Batman out when all of Batman's gadgets that he would normally use to dominate in a fight seem to come up short. But even Green Lantern and Batman together proved no match for the Man of Steel. Super tickle! No, Gucci, 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 no, we're not talking about the new R-rated series that drops F-bombs and C-words and anything else it can to prove that it is indeed adult. Harley has had a run in with young Damien as early as episode 4, but for this we're once more looking at the Injustice universe. Here Damien is Nightwing, a mantle he took up after accidentally killing his older brother Dick Grayson in a moment of anger. This would of course put a huge distance between him and Bruce, Dick's his favorite, don't at me. He ends up allying with the regime, and as a result when he gets into it with Harley she is not here for it, and she hands his butt right back to him, channeling all her rage at what she feels is his mistaken allegiance all the way back at him. This ties into her feelings about her former relationship with the Joker. She goes so hard she nearly kills him and needs to be pulled off. Take that training with the League of Assassins, that doesn't have anything on an angry Harley Quinn. Number 4, The Hulk. 
Any battle with the Hulk proves interesting as not many can take on the green giant and come out victorious. Well, the Hulk is Marvel and Superman is DC, we all bow down to the Hulk's strength, no matter what side of the fence we're on here. In other words, if a hero can beat the Hulk, it means something, namely that they are one of the strongest heroes in existence, because Hulk is on another level when it comes to his strength. During this crossover, Bruce Banner ended up being agitated by Lex Luthor and transforming into the Hulk in Metropolis. With innocence in danger, Superman swooped in and was forced to fight the Hulk out of the area. Superman fought him all the way to his Fortress of Solitude, but found himself unable to calm the Hulk down, and was forced to beat the Hulk by punching him so hard that he was knocked into the Phantom Zone. Now that is some strength. Number 3 Doctor Fate This battle was a surprisingly quick one. You would think that it wouldn't even be a fair fight for the Man of Steel due to his weakness to magic, a weakness that really only exists to prevent him from being so overpowered. Remember the original Superman, like before the 80s? No weaknesses and he just seemed to have a limitless amount of convenient superpowers? Oh, those were the ultimate days for our caped vigilante. No longer unfortunately. Superman was retcon and given limits and weaknesses to make him a more interesting character. After all, everyone enjoys reading about a struggle. We want to see Superman, you know, try and fail sometimes. This battle between Dr. Fate and Earth 2 Superman, the Kal El clone known as Brutal, was not that though. Not a struggle. Not at all. Superman snuck up on the magical hero and smashed his helmet, which is kind of Dr. Fate's power source. Therefore, in doing so, he instantly defeated him. Well, that was easy. That was easy. Number 2 Thor In the JLA slash Avengers series from 2003, we saw the two famous superheroes from competing comic book powerhouse publishers come to blows as they raced one another to prevent the opposing team from seizing the 12 items of power. In the series we saw a battle that put Thor up against Superman in the Savage Lands in a one on one fight over the cosmic cube. These two strong characters had always been a heated topic of debate for fans who mauled at who would be the victor should the two come to blows in a crossover. The answer? Superman proved to be the stronger after stopping an attack from Thor and then just KOing him in a battle, ending the fame debate once and for all. Just kidding, I'm sure everyone's still debating. Y'all can have a debate in the comments who you think would win again in a fight. Number 1 Shazam In the Injustice Gods Among Us video game, we saw these two similar heroes come to blows. While many might think that Shazam having magic at his disposal would allow him to make quick work of Superman, being that Superman's weakness is magic, turns out they'd be wrong. In Injustice, we see a darker side of Superman, one who is no longer holding back his power. He freezes Shazam's mouth shut and melts his brain with his heat vision after Shazam disagrees with the Man of Steel. Yikes. Remind me to never get in an argument with Injustice. To Superman. At number 10, we have a fight under a red sun. In 1978, there was a comic with an evil alien leader called Ratlat that comes to Earth looking for Earth's champion to fight his champion. Superman and, drumroll please, Muhammad Ali nominate themselves. I mean, it's 1978, that's the year that Ali became the first heavyweight champion to win the belt three times, so it makes sense. The alien leader decides they should first fight to see who is the best, and to make it fair, they have a fight off world in the light of a red sun, thus making Superman just like the rest of us. Funny enough, Ali crushes him, like no question about it. Then he goes and fights the aliens, best fighter, and beats him too. That's right, Ali becomes the greatest fighter in the universe. Then, because Superman is weakened, he also saves him and helps him get his powers back. At number 9, we have a life sucking plant. Eat your heart out, poison ivy. In The Man Who Has Everything, Robin, Wonder Woman, and Batman are heading to Superman's Fortress of Solitude for his birthday party. I know, super cute, right? I guess I never really think about the fact that, you know, supers have birthdays and stuff like that, so cute, cute. However, instead of getting his drink on to celebrate or putting out snacks for his guests, he is under attack by Mongol, who has brought along Black Mercy. What is that, you might ask? Well, it is a plant that lulls you into a dreamlike state while it sucks the life out of you. I know, it's a very, very evil plant. Wonder Woman and Batman end up under its control in the heroic efforts to save Superman. Enter Robin. This is his moment to shine. Robin intervenes just before 
before Mogul kills Superman and places the Black Mercy on Mogul instead. At number 8 we have an altered future. In Justice League 3000 there is a universe that is controlled by 5 super beings. To battle these guys the Justice League is brought back to life but without their full powers. It almost gets comical in my mind at this point. Superman since he is essentially a god is brought back a lot weaker than the rest. I guess to balance the scale out a bit. The huge point though is that he can no longer fly and he keeps forgetting that he can can't. Thankfully, the one time that he tries to jump off of a big building, the Green Lantern is around and is able to grab him before he falls to his death. It's just kind of a ridiculous one. At number 7 we have the Black Light. In Justice League America Act of God, it shows the aftermath of an unexplainable event called the Black Light, which irrevocably removes the powers of every super being. As you might imagine, this drives a lot of superheroes crazy. It was their purpose in life and now it's just been taken away. Lois Lane grows tired of just plain old Clark Kent and leaves him as, you know, maybe no surprise to fans, he ends up getting together with Wonder Woman. Woo, it happens. But their relationship goes south when Clark is just down in the dumps and depressed over it and Diana is all like hopeful and this is just a test and we're all going to get our powers back if you if you just have faith it's going to come together. He ends up in a mess. He ends up homeless, living on the streets for a time. But then they make up and they get married and they have a kid. So, you know, it ends on a happy note there. And there's also a hint that the child might carry on the super legacy. <gasps> there is hope. On to number six, where we are looking at a sort of time travel thing with a red sun thing. In Justice League Unlimited, there is an episode called Hereafter, where there are villains called the Superman's Revenge Squad. Creative name, I know. In a battle, Wonder Woman is about to get shot by an energy cannon when Superman dives in front of her to save her from the energy and it vaporizes him on the spot. Twist, it actually transports him 30,000 years into the future where he awakens with no powers as he is under the earth's now red sun. In this future, he meets his immortal villain, Vandal Savage, who actually feels bad about having killed the Justice League and quickening the death of the Earth. And since he has millennials to think over this, he realizes that the quest for power is meaningless. Lucky for Superman, he happens to have a time machine on hand in his mansion that was built on the rubble of Metropolis. So Superman gets a special power source to repower it and repower the superheroes in his time. Vidal tells him everything he needs to know in order to beat his former self and then Superman heads back to put things right. Number 5 Wonder Woman This one is only ranked so low because it is so brutal and it hurts my heart whenever I think about it. This fight happened in an alternate timeline where Superman and Batman become tyrannical leaders. Wonder Woman was one of the few heroes left who was attempting to save the world from their fascist supremacy. She managed to take out Bruce but unfortunately it was no match for the enraged Superman that she ended up crossing paths with who was obviously pissed that she had taken out his BFF, Batman. Clark didn't just beat Wonder Woman though, no 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 no, he destroyed her. He demolished her shield, blasted through her bracelets and ended up strangling her with her own lasso of truth. Oh, devastating. At number 4 we have a filter on yellow sunlight. In Batman the Animated Series, there is an episode called Solar Powers where Superman's resilience on yellow sunlight is focused on. Suddenly Superman finds his powers failing him. He starts to feel weak at just the wrong moment. Lois Lane is in danger of dying in a cable car that is stalled and an emergency beam that is cutting the mechanism that's keeping it all together is happening. I know, it's stressful. He does save her but it's really really hard this time and the weight of the cable car is just aggressive on him. The big bad in this episode is Luminous. He was an inventor at LexCorp until he blows the whistle on some of their questionable activities and then of course has to leave and ends up with a sour taste in his mouth. In this episode, he hacks LexCorp's satellites around the Earth, a jab at Lex, and programs them to filter out all the yellow sunlight, which is what Superman's powers are based on. So two birds, one stone here, Superman and Lex. Superman, or I guess we will just call him Clark now, has to figure out a way to put a stop to him as a regular man. Spoiler, he does. I know, you're shocked. In the last battle, he fires a laser shot at Spider-Man. It's deflected onto the master controls, shutting down the filter and allowing Superman, now at full power, to take Luminous to the police. 
At number three, we have the old switcheroo. In Superman, Batman issue number 53, Superman and Batman team up to fight the Silver Banshee. Now she has this special artifact with her called the Crawdor Brooch. The Silver Banshee ends up kicking their ass and running off, but Superman can't use his x-ray vision suddenly and Batman is unharmed from what they just went through, so it's really strange. And then it turns out that they actually switched powers, which really means Batman is basically a god and Superman is just a dude, just a regular man now. Batman gets a little zealous with his newfound power and starts global patrols and gets more and more aggressive with the bad guys so eventually the Justice League realizes that they kind of probably going to have to take him down. But Superbat, I'm going to call him, is just too strong. So they finally get Superbat and Superman together with the Crawdor brooch and Satana's magic and they're able to reverse what was done. At number two, we have a Sun Eater. I know it sounds cool, right? In the final night, there was a crossover. An alien refugee called Dusk shows up on Earth warning us that an exceptionally powerful entity called Sun Eater is coming to Earth. They do try to stop him, but sadly he does in engulf our sun and the earth quickly becomes a dark wintry wasteland. Everyone is getting very depressed and it looks like humanity only has maybe five days before the earth becomes totally uninhabitable. Once again, the yellow sun is gone so Superman loses most of his power, but just most. Love how writers change it up depending on what's needed for the story. Who should show up to save the day but Hal Jordan. He's recently come back from turning into an evil parallax, so he's trying to get some good karma here I think. He ends up flying right into the dying sun, absorbing all the energy from it, redirects the energy with his green energy, and reignites the sun. Thank goodness he was the neighborhood to help Superman out. At number one, we have Red Kryptonite. In the War of Superman, there are Kryptonite super criminals Zod, Non, and Ursa. They threaten to destroy Earth when, once again, the new Krypton explodes. <sighs> Tough planet to be on. This time, the gang assembles, and it is Superboy, Nightwing, Supergirl, Flamebird, Steel, and the Guardian. Superman and Supergirl fly into space and are trying to stop the attack before it even gets to us, but Lex is working with Zod and happens to have a red kryptonite missile waiting for them. He fires it at them, and they start suffocating in the vacuum of space when they lose their powers. Thankfully, Flamebird steps in and burns as bright as she possibly can over to make the yellow sun burn through the red kryptonite to get them their powers back. Sadly, this uses all of her energy and she actually loses her life instead. Silver lining though, this just lights a fire under the gang to take Zod out even quicker. Number 10, Batman. Harley Quinn first debuted in the DC Animated Universe, the DCAU, in the episode Joker's Favor back in 1992. She was meant to just be a one-off, but fans were intrigued and really liked the character, so she stuck around. As the series went on, she would eventually be given a backstory, just how she had fallen for the Clown Prince of Crime in the first place. This was handled in the episode Mad Love, which is also the episode where she bests Batman. In a bid to make her put in happy, Harley takes and modifies one of his plans, using herself as bait, claiming she finally realizes that what's going on just isn't funny anymore, and she goes to meet Batman on the pier. She then knocks him out and hangs him upside down over a tank of piranha, correcting the portion of the Joker's plan that he couldn't figure out, namely how to make the fish smile. While she does get Batman trussed up, he manages to psych her out, but by that time the Joker gets there and has the opposite reaction to what she was expecting. He is infuriated with her and pushes her out the window. Number 9, Tim Drake. Still in the DCAU, we're jumping forward in the timeline a bit to Batman beyond, but really to when Tim Drake was Robin. Harley was able to knock him out with her mallet in an alley by pretending to be a woman getting mugged. This was so he could be brought back to the Joker and tortured until he became a little mini Joker who they could then raise together as they had decided that they wanted kids. The whole thing was horrifying and would end with Harley seemingly falling to her demise, but cartoon logic rules and she survived and was shown to have had grandchildren who had grown up to join the Joker's gang, much to her disappointment. Number 8, Nightwing. This comes to us from the animated movie Batman and Harley Quinn. You know the one where Harley ties Nightwing to a bed and has sex with him in a scene that you could never have done the other way. Regardless of whether you found it hot, 
or rapey. So when Batman and Nightwing are tracking down Harley Quinn, Dick is the one that finds her, and the two have a fight in an alleyway outside where she works. The best place for fights. Alleys. And she bests him hard. Guess all that training didn't stick. It's after this that she takes him back to her apartment and gets undressed in front of him. And then when he has a biological response, which fun fact does not indicate consent, has her way with him. He seems into it. But again, you couldn't do this the other way. Hence my salt. Salt. Number seven, Black Canary. Heading over to the Injustice verse for this one, we have Black Canary coming upon a newly reformed Harley Quinn in the Arrow Cave. And Harley and her end up getting into a pretty intense fight. They're evenly matched throughout most of it, until Black Canary, who is down for the moment, needs to ask for a bucket to throw up into, which effectively stops the fight, as Harley realizes that she's pregnant. Which, yeah, not a time to get into a fight where people who don't know could just go for the stomach. It's a vulnerable spot, irresponsible. The two end up sitting down and having a heart to heart, where Harley opens up about having a daughter of her own who was fathered by the Joker who she gave up so that she could have a better life. Such was the beginning of a beautiful friendship, defeated with kindness and empathy. Friendship. Number six, Wonder Woman. Sorta. Along the same vein, we have the time Harley joined the Amazons in the event Countdown to Final Crisis, which as we now know was far from the Final Crisis. False advertising. This comic needs to change its name. So Harley would end up in an Amazonian run women's shelter and would even train every so briefly with Diana. Harley has wormed her way into the Amazon's heart in the New 52 as well. She does that. Some heroes find her endearing and want to give her a chance. Power Girl felt this way too. I guess this number is just all about her making heroes not even want to fight her because they've low-key become friends. Friendship. At number five, we have a sand being. This one's a bit of a way back playback, but in Superman issue number 233, an experiment is done to turn all kryptonite on Earth to iron, but at the same time, a new being is formed in the sand. It's created from soil and rock and a burst of raw energy and cast in the mold of Superman. In the next issue, more is revealed when he flies too close to Superman, he gets weak and dizzy and is forced to stop what he's in the middle of. Then in issue 237, the sand thing smashes right into him and he loses his ability to fly. He falls right down through the atmosphere, crashes into the earth and can't seem to fly again. He's still able to leap over a small mountain though, so that's, so that's good. In the same issue, he's able to feel bullets hit him, he can't quite bend the barrel of a gun, it's really hard work to knock these bad guys heads together, he's just not himself. Eventually we discover that the sand creature comes from another dimension. He has one third of Superman's power. The best surgeons are called to see if they can sort out the issue, but they can't really. Then he goes to battle the sand creature. They end up chasing each other through the center of the Earth's core and it wreaks havoc on the Earth, as it would, and their battle is continuing in space. Superman is beside himself upset, and then he's pulled out of a trance that he had been put into to see what would happen if they dueled. So they didn't actually duel. And then they both decide that it's not worth it, but that the Sand Superman doesn't give back all of his powers to make sure that no one has that much power ever. And then he goes back to his own dimension. Although the next issue, he easily survives a supernova. So I'm not really sure if that stuck. It seems like it didn't really, but it was a thing. Number four, Booster Gold. We now come to Heroes in Crisis. The Harley from this story, well, let's say she had some special the author likes me OP powers. One of the heroes Harley would defeat in this series, yes, I said one of, was Booster Gold. Her and Booster would both for a while believe the other was responsible for the deaths at the sanctuary. This was the super secret farmhouse that every hero and villain knew about, that you had to go to, otherwise you were shamed. This was for therapy from an AI who then deleted the information, except it didn't actually. Harley would angrily take on Booster Gold, and he wouldn't prove to be much of a challenge for her. Why didn't he use his fancy 25th century tech? Cause well, he didn't want to hurt her. She just needed to get that mad out of her system. This was very much everyone beat up Booster Gold the series. At least he got to have some pie. Number three, Batman, again. Yes, Harley took on Batman in Heroes in Crisis as well, and she was able to lasso him up with Wonder Woman's lasso of truth. You know some people say lasso? Do you say lasso or lasso? Let me know. She got it right around his neck while on his back. That's right, Harley Quinn was able to kind of fight the tranny to a standstill by capturing Batman. In Heroes in Crisis, Harley could do anything. She got the lasso off of Wonder Woman after 
after she got a hug from her after faking her out. Cause she also got a lot of hugs in this series. Everybody was really concerned about her. She nearly broke Batman's neck. Number two, The Flash, Wally West. Wally West ended up being the core of Heroes in Crisis. And some feel it was a moment of complete character assassination. While others thought it was a brilliant commentary on mental health. Regardless of how you feel about that, in this comic, Harley beat The Flash. That's right, an ordinary woman with no powers beat the fastest man alive with an oversized hammer. Now it would turn out there was a reason for this, kinda. An elaborate plot set up by Wally after he had snapped and killed the other people at Sanctuary. Cause he read everybody's files, you know, the deleted ones. He then used the speed force to time travel to cover up his crimes, including killing a future version of himself. But Wally has flash forward now, so maybe there's still hope for him, I believe. And finally at number one, Superman. Yes, Harley Quinn took on the Man of Steel, a depowered Man of Steel, but still, let me explain. This took place in Harley's little black book series in issue five. An alien wanted to set up a boxing match to take on Earth's champion, the Man of Steel, and ended up with the challenger being Harley Quinn. He depowered the Man of Steel so it would be a fair fight, and then proceeded to sit back and watch the action unfold. So Harley handily beat Clark, no contest really, she just had the moves, and Clark apparently has never taken anything close to resembling a martial arts class, even though this is hardly the first time he's been depowered. So Superman is knocked out by Harley Quinn, who is thrilled, though the reader is reminded to take Harley's retellings of events with a grain of salt. Still, this series is meant to be a fun romp of Harley adventures. And what more of a tall tale is there than her taking on the Man of Steel? Harley does love roller derby, maybe she also loves boxing. Number 10, Captain Carrot. These two fought it out in the two-parter Convergence Harley Quinn. After all, it would take a melding of multiversal realities in order for these two to even be able to fight one another as Captain Carrot hails from the alternate Earth of Earth 26. While this fight might not seem like anything to celebrate, it should be noted that Captain Carrot is actually pretty powerful. He possesses one of the most epic powers, I think, of all time, that of cartoon physics. I don't know about you, but being able to defy the law of physics that govern matter and molecules in our world sounds pretty powerful to me. While the physical kind of fight came to a stalemate, in the end it would appear as though Harley won without really meaning to when she offered Captain Carrot snacks from her friend Poison Ivy's garden. In other words, those carrots are probably all kinds of toxic. Although Harley also joined Captain Carrot in a quick snack, the poison would not actually affect her as thanks to Ivy she's total immunity. Captain Carrot, however, looked like he wasn't doing great. He was like, ugh, poisonous garden. Number 9, Damian Wayne. Harley Quinn made quick work of Damian Wayne, aka Robin, in the Harley Quinn animated series. Here, Harley was looking to make a name for herself as a supervillain and leader of her own criminal gang, striking out on her own. She wanted to take Joker's spot as Batman's top nemesis, and even managed to steal Batman's Batmobile in hopes of baiting him out. Unfortunately for Harley, it wasn't Bats who answered the call, but instead, Bats Jr., aka Damian Wayne. Harley was very disappointed disappointed and refused to even really fight Damien despite him claiming that he was a more than worthy nemesis for her, being trained by birth by the League of Assassins. Harley defeated him far too easily, hanging him by his cape on a meat hook in the warehouse that they were in. Although Damien of course later embellished the story and insisted that Harley and he were official nemeses. Also, I love Damian Wayne in the Harley Quinn animated series. I think it's my favorite <laughs> incarnation of Damian Wayne. Damian Wayne fans, please don't hate me. I mean that with the utmost respect. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it, more Harley lists, yes, let's have it happen, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Also comment below with your like favorite Harley issues or Harley stories. Number eight, Jason Todd loves Barbara Gordon. Another really brutal moment, possibly one of my least favorite parts, I think, of Three Jokers, comes at the end. After taking Jason in and helping him to recover after he was attacked, Jason at one point attempts to kiss Barbara. This kind of makes a little bit of sense because, you know, they've got shared trauma, but this felt weirdly forced still and out of place to me because, you know, Bab still seems like she's kind of trying to be there for Jason like a sister. Like, I get that Jason is reaching out because for years he's felt like he was left behind, abandoned, and you know, like I said, they do have shared trauma, but Bab's and Jason's relationship has 
always felt more platonic to me. And if anything, more than that, more familial. Like they were truly, you know, brother and sister. And when Babs reaches out, it's very clear she's coming from this place. And yet Jason seems to struggle to read the room and acts on his romantic feelings anyways, if that's even what's really going on for him. Honestly, I think it's, he's just confused. The third issue ends with a kind of weird note with Jason leaves on our apartment door and that ends up falling off and then being swept away by the building's janitor, which is especially weird and kind of cringe because it seems to imply like that whole sequence of shots that if Babs found it, things may have been different between them. Um, other than Barbara having to once more reaffirm her boundaries with Jason, I don't see how it could have ended otherwise. What a strange romance subplot that I never expected nor ever really wanted. But hey, there it is. Number seven, Birds of Prey. Never mind just beating Black Canary, at one point Harley Quinn manages to evade the entire Birds of Prey team, including Renee Montoya in the Black Label limited series, Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey. This comic gives us an alternate story for what would happen with their team up in comparison to the DCEU film. Instead of tracking down a diamond for Black Mask so that she can avoid him killing her, here Harley is aiming to take down her enemies in Gotham and ends up teaming up with the Birds of Prey to do so. But it turns out initially, neither they or the GCPD want Harley in Gotham, as she's a liability. After her brief team up with the Birds of Prey in issue number one, she ends up captured by Renee Montoya, but gives her and the birds the slip in issue number two, escaping custody with a secret ally by tunneling out of a restaurant bathroom. This iteration of the team includes Black Canary, Huntress, and Cassandra Kane, who we learn is actually filling in for Barbara Gordon, who's out with the broken leg. Also, if you saw the Birds of Ray film, and regardless of how you felt about it, this is this is a comic you should read. It's really funny, it's really great. I think it's I think it's really fun. Everything black label is usually pretty good. Usually. Number six, Shazam. Another hero who Harley ends up taking on and surprisingly defeating an injustice, we are talking about Shazam. I know, pretty impressive. Harley ends up fighting Shazam as both are on opposite sides of the superhero conflict, with Shazzy siding with Supes and Harl's allying herself with Batman. The two fight in year five, but also fought previously in year three, with Harley taking full advantage of Shazam's sweet naivete, tossing her hammer at him, which it turned out was actually a bomb. That time around, the hammer explodes in his face, knocking him out. Number five, Green Lantern. There was some interference on this fight, which as you may have guessed by now, usually happens with Harley. But regardless, Harley was definitely in the process of winning when the interference really helped her to crush her enemy, who in this case was Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. That's right, Harley won in a cosmic arm wrestling match against Hal. In Harley's little black book in issue number two, the two characters square off when Harley, after being outbid for a genuine Green Lantern ring online, instead gets her hands on something better, a black and red lantern ring. How fitting. It is a combined ring formed from both colors of lanterns. In the end, red and black lantern Harley defeats Hal only to have her ring taken. Hal knocked out and is of course kind of forced to don his green lantern ring in order to help save the day. Another fun team up for the books, or the little black book I suppose I should say. Number four, Batman. Harley Quinn has beaten Batman on more than one occasion, but for me, one of her most iconic victory moments comes from the Batman animated series, when Harley successfully traps Batman for the Joker and is planning to basically waste him. Of course, although Harley almost successfully ends Bat's life, he manages to prey on her insecurities regarding her relationship with the Joker. He convinces Harley that the Joker will be upset with her if she just wastes him without contacting him or telling him anything about it. So she calls him up, and then when he arrives, it's revealed that Batman was actually right. In provoking a fight between the two villains, Batman is able to escape. But in this scenario, if Joker hadn't been involved, Harley would have likely been completely successful in executing her Puddin's plan. This victory not only proves Harley's might next to Joker, but also is a heartbreaking one, as it illustrates how harmful her relationship with the Joker is, and how its toxicity also succeeds in often holding her brilliance and her individualism hostage. Number three, Wonder Woman. Harley's little black book really is a treat of a mini team up series. If you're a Harley fan and you haven't read this one yet, or at least dipped your toe in, I highly recommend it. Back in issue number one of the series, Harley manages to defeat Wonder Woman by catching her unawares and successfully kidnapping her. Of course, Harley actually is aiming to do this for Wonder Woman's own good and is in fact a big fan of hers, as we find out. So it isn't a malicious defeat at all. Still though, using sleeping gas, Harley manages to incapacitate Wonder Woman and swaps clothes with her in an attempt to impersonate her. In the end, this results in a glorious team up of the two badass ladies fighting side by side. 
Number two, Superman. We don't really know how, and she didn't do it alone, but in the Black Label Limited series, Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey, in issue number one, we open up on Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn being served by Superman. Together, they seem to have made him their prisoner by threatening the life of Jimmy Olsen. And Superman is waiting on them in return for his whereabouts so that he can run off and save Jimmy. Of course, it all turns out that this is part of a dream, but it's a fun sequence and could actually be based on real events in this Black Label label reality. Black Label comics typically happen outside of continuity, just FYI. Whether or not this was real though, Harley also took on Supes in a boxing match and won in Harley's Little Black Book in the second to last issue in issue 5. Number 1. The Trinity If you thought the Man of Steel was too much for Harley Quinn to take on, obviously you would be wrong. And you'd actually be super super wrong about that, as Harley has not only taken on Superman multiple times, but also in one fight managed to take on Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman all in one go. The holy trinity of DC supers, if you will. This all went down in Heroes in Crisis, when the superhero trio was trying to track Harley down as they believed she was behind the mass murder that went down at the sanctuary. Harley made quick work of the team, using Batman's contingency plans even against his allies and the team's love and affection for one another to her advantage. Kicking off the list at number 10, Nightwing. Coming from the Court of Owls storyline where a body was found with a message, Bruce Wayne will die tomorrow. That's what it said, written right there on the wall. Harry Potter, Chamber of Secrets style. It's ooh, so mysterious, okay. Pretty concerning warning, but when Batman finds Dick Grayson's DNA under the victim's fingernail, he has even more questions. It's later revealed that William Cobb is the great-grandfather of Dick Grayson. Spoilers right off the hop. But Batman is trying to piece together this mystery alone. He's not sharing all these details, and Dick is obviously upset. He's yelling at Bruce. He's demanding to shed more light on this fact that he just dropped on him. Bruce interrupts him with a left hook to the jaw, knocking Nightwing down. He did this simply to check one of Nightwing's teeth for an owl logo. Now to be fair, he did have the owl in his tooth. Bruce was right, Dick was supposed to be a talon growing up, but I'm pretty sure there's other ways to check a tooth here. I mean, you have tech that can see through cars, I don't know, just tell him to lean back. Be like, what's that? And scan his mouth, that's it. Although a surprise bat punch works too, that clearly works as well. Number 9. The Incredible Hulk When DC and Marvel combine powers, it's an odd but beautiful time. In DC's special series issue 27 titled The Monster and the Madman, Angry Orphan Bruce vs Angrier Orphan Bruce, who comes out on top? Well, given the title of this list, you already know what happens, but how? That's the question. Bruce Banner was working at a division of Wayne Research. He was developing a gamma gun, said to cure diseases, so Banner was hoping he could fix his mean green problem while at work. Sounds like a plan. But when the Joker comes in and steals the gamma gun, Bruce goes goes green, makes a mess, and in turn, Batman shows up to save the day. You can't just punch the Hulk until he goes to sleep this time around, you won't even get close. So Batman, in fact, does get close, a little too close for comfort, as his spine was seconds away from snapping like a pencil. So Batman used a chemical that would knock the beast out. Thing is, the Hulk can hold his breath for a long time, so in order for him to inhale, Batman had to kick him right in the stomach, and then down goes the green Goliath. And before we continue on with this list, you guys know the drill, if you want to go and give us a thumbs up, that would be awesome, it really does help us out a lot at this channel and obviously be like throwing all that nerdy content back so it's a nice circle of love hit that thumbs up thank you back to the list Number 8. Wonder Woman. Rich Orphan vs Daughter of Zeus. This one is shocking, I'll admit. Coming from Batman Confidential issue 53, Batman is facing the team and right from the get-go, trying not to say right off the bat, he says the woman is the most powerful. Right on. The woman being Wonder Woman. He decides he has to take her down first, but after his knuckles shatter, Bruce realizes it might be a little harder than he thinks. She still needs to breathe though, so there is hope. Batman beats her without any heavy metal knight armor, anything like that, and then after he gets Superman's powers, he takes out the entire team again. All these superhumans, it's always air. It's always air that's the weakness. You just gotta knock the wind out of them and then they're good. Like every kid in the playground, when they get winded, they're like, and then they have to go home. Number seven, Green Arrow. Whenever Batman breaks his one rule, it's pretty alarming. He did it a few times in the early comics. I mean, he pushed a guy into acid, he threw another guy into a knife, and then he broke a dude's neck with one kick. It was pretty intense, but nothing comes close to the time that Batman beat Green Arrow half to death just for Superman's birthday. Yeah, hear this one out. This takes place in Superman and Batman's absolute power storyline. It takes place in an alternate timeline where Superman and Batman were raised as evil rulers instead of the protectors that they 
are now. It's a stressful but pretty awesome time, I gotta admit. They're hunting down Green Arrow, and the fight, as you would guess, doesn't last too long. Archer almost gets Superman as well. He comes very close. Clark catches the arrow, and then moments later, Kryptonite explodes out of it. The classic Loki Hawkeye trick. It's good. Always works. Batman gets upset here. He says, hey, if you just hurt him, I'll kill you. So that's pretty crazy for Bruce. That's like 0 to 100 for Bruce Wayne. They brawl it out a bit, and then when Archer goes down, Bruce says, get up, because he wants more. At that point, I would my jeans. That's crazy. He's so angry. Now, this is when Superman flies in and turns Archer into dust with his laser vision. He's telling Green Arrow's corpse to obey or die, so it's very intense. Batman did all the heavy lifting here, and it's even more twisted when you remember that he gave Archer up to Superman as a birthday present. Number six, the Ninja Turtles. Batman beating up the Foot Clan and coming face to face with Shredder is pretty awesome. But when he meets the turtles, he has no idea what exactly he's facing. He's like, are these good guys or bad guys? I'm very confused. All he sees are giant moody turtle monsters with weapons, just like eating pizza. So of course, a brawl goes down. It also doesn't help that the turtles were breaking and entering into a pizza joint. Like you're literally breaking the law, you're a bad guy. Batman thinks these guys are villains, so he takes them on all at the same time. He impressed the turtles while doing so, and it takes Master Splinter's arrival just to calm things down. But even then, Batman's like, a rat? No sweat, I'll fight you too. Batman vs. Ratman, let's do it. He doesn't beat up Splinter, don't worry, because Splinter makes a run for it, which is crazy. The fact that Splinter and the turtles had to run away from Bruce Wayne, that's awesome. We had to include it on this list. Until next time, Batman, just eating pizza. Number five, Mera. Returning to the Flashpoint universe for a hot minute, where Wonder Woman is now an oppressive queen of the Amazons, the way she rules over them is dark. It's cruel. It's nothing like how we know and love Diana now. So naturally, her combat skills share a hint of evil as well. She's one of the two main villains in the 2013 animated film Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox, and it's here where we see Diana and Aquaman fall for each other out of nowhere. Aquaman's wife, Mera, is of course hurt during this, as she witnessed this affair go down, so she approached Wonder Woman and was like, hey man, not so cool what happened there with you and my husband. I don't know, let's talk about it. Wonder Woman responds by taking her head clean off. Her body was then later sent to Aquaman as a gift, and then of course, a massive war began. This is incredibly dark, but most things in the Flashpoint universe are. I mean, she kept and wore Mera's crown too. Like, come on, really, dude? Number four, Superman. One of the biggest movies of 2016. It's been teased since I Am Legend in the very background. Batman vs. Superman, Son of Krypton vs. Bat of Gotham. Who will come out on top? Hmm. Well, the general audience wasn't a big fan of this outcome, but Bruce Wayne took this one. Bruce almost ended the god too, but luckily he was reminded of his mother and therefore his own mortality, so he didn't go through with that execution. In Batman vs. Superman, I mean, sure, Bruce had kryptonite, but Superman easily could have punched him into vapor. I wasn't too happy with this win, but after accumulating over $870 million in the box office, we figured it was worth a Martha mention. In the comics too, Batman has come out on top, and in Justice Year 5, Batman beats Superman in a back alley, and of course, in The Dark Knight Returns, Bruce gets pretty close to ending the son of Krypton. Number three, Azrael. Right after the 1993 Nightfall storyline when Batman got wrecked by Bane, his back was broken. He decided to pass the Batman mantle to not Dick Grayson, no, instead he chose Jean-Paul Valley, AKA Azrael. This guy is a crazy substitute. I mean, his run as Batman wasn't the same at all. Batman wasn't nearly as violent as Azrael. He's also just messy and irresponsible the way he handles things. Not really a great look for Gotham, but we have to admit he is a tad impressive because he did beat Bane with his, you know, advanced Autobot looking suit. So he did a good job on paper. He was a decent successor, but not a permanent one. Once Bruce recovered, he had to physically force Azbat to leave the position. He got too cozy in the crime fighting life, but you know what, I don't blame him. But yeah, as far as being Batman, even the style changes were drastic. He had claws. I don't know, I'm not a big fan of claws. If someone was saving my life from a crime and he had claws looking like that, I would think I'm in more trouble. Number two, Green Lantern. This one comes from Justice League issue five. Fans refer to it simply as the punch. At this time in comics, Batman was about to become the leader of the Justice League International, and Guy Gardner doesn't really share the same enthusiasm as the rest of the team. For more than one issue, he makes it very clear that he doesn't want Batman to run the show, although Batman was clearly a better fit for the role. Whatever, people get jealous. Guy was being sour, he was being a sour guy, so he challenged Batman to a fight without the use of his power ring. Just one human to another. Batman was already a human before, so it's gonna get messy. Batman easily knocked him down, and you guessed it, he did so with one punch. Yeah, of course, he's Batman, and without the ring, you're literally just a guy. Literally a guy. Blue Beetle started shouting one punch, one punch over and over again. He was hyped up, and readers were for sure doing the same. I know I was. 
And finally, number one, the Justice League. One of the more impressive defeats comes from the Tower of Babel storyline that began back in JLA issue 43. It's a four-parter written by Mark Wade, where Raish al Ghul and the League of Assassins strike against every member of the Justice League using their personal lives and vulnerabilities. How does one get all this information? Well, it's all thanks to Batman and his trust issues. See, Bruce was keeping a hidden file that exposed all the strengths and weaknesses of the JLA. He made this file just in case any of them were to go rogue. So this man just gave away revenge recipes. Here you go. Here's the password. Enjoy. Batman figured all these out, so he wrote them down. Okay, so red kryptonite to use on Superman. Okay. Nanites to trap Wonder Woman in a virtual battle with herself. A post-hypnotic suggestion would make the Green Lantern will himself into blindness. He has a Vibra bullet as well that would send the Flash into light speed seizures. And a magnesium virus would cause Martian Manhunter's skin to burst into flames when he's exposed to air. Also, Scarecrow's fear toxin would make Aquaman afraid of water and Plastic Man. Well, you just freeze him and... Flick him. Some blame Rachel Ghoul, but I blame the guy who had a dirty file of secrets. I don't know. I don't trust rich orphans anymore. That's my thing. I'm for sure going through all my friends' phones now. And attend the Flash. Now, The Flash has fought alternate versions of himself a lot, and I mean a lot. But I think that the most interesting time was when it was him from an alternate future where Wally West had died. And this future Barry's solution was to come back and kill his past self so the timeline of events that caused Wally to die wouldn't happen. Yeah, I still don't understand it either. However, to gain enough speed, Barry has to kill all of his rogues, including Gorilla Grodd, Mirror Master, and Captain Cold, who he just like sits with as he dies. It's weird. I also don't get how going on a killing spree helps you gain more speed, but whatever, maybe Reverse Flash did it. He eventually does gain enough speed and runs back in time to try to kill himself. But both the present Barry and a future version of Wally West fight off future Barry and future Barry gets killed. But before dying, he's able to mutter Thawne in an attempt to explain that Thawne killed his mother. Yeah, gotta love comics, right? They make so much sense. In at 9, Mecha Vibe. I will admit the Flash TV show has gone in some interesting directions recently. However, the most recent season saw Barry lose basically all of his emotions for a time while trying to build an artificial speed force. But this ended up causing Barry to be very logical but also weirdly impulsive, becoming a form of pseudo villain for a couple episodes. But when choosing to take only Iris out of the Mirrorverse, the team retaliates and tries to stop him. But in the process, Barry absolutely destroys all of them because he literally can predict where a ball will appear before it's thrown. He just puts his hand up and this is a ball that will just bounce in random directions that Cisco throws and then he doesn't move his hand and catches it. Like what? Gotta love that speed thinking. And you know, it's not like that would have helped against DeVoe or anything. <laughs> Gotta love when they introduced new abilities that would have really helped previously, huh? Oh, and that damn copyright neutral lightsaber battle in the finale, seriously? That had to be the most ridiculous bull I've ever seen on this show. Like, I thought Godspeed was gonna pull some like sick ass Zeus bull and like start like grab the lightning and like start throwing it, but no, they, they had he made a lightning saber. <sighs> this show, man. And it ain't Green Arrow. Okay, so during the Elseworlds crossover event, Flash and Green Arrow swapped their powers. So Oliver Queen became the Flash and Barry Allen became the Green Arrow. Yet even with that, Barry was in essence still his old self until he started having to take on a darker personality in order to be the Green Arrow. Before doing this, however, he did finally get his revenge on Oliver after around six years. In the very first crossover, Flash vs. Arrow, we saw Oliver training Barry on how to case an environment. He did so by placing remote control crossbows in a field and told Barry to catch an arrow. After he did, the remote control crossbows shot Barry in the back. Literally. Barry, however, got his revenge in Elseworlds where he did the same thing to Oliver on Earth 38, when training Oliver on how to use his speed. I don't know how he got the bows there, because like, I mean, it was another Earth, but it still counts. He also beat the Amazo robot after it had gained the abilities of Green Arrow, among others, so that certainly counts as well. In its seven other flashes. When Wally goes berserk and starts killing other speedsters, you know it's gonna be an interesting issue. Yeah, in the Future State storyline, we see some flashes, including Jay Garrick, Barry Allen, and Max Mercury fighting off various thugs with blasters, swords, and futuristic torpedo grenades. But one of the speedsters gets injured and they have to retreat. They later, for some reason, get inside each other's dreams and end up in some psychic plane of existence where Wally ends up finding them somehow. It also seems to be like a version of Wally that's also Black Flash or like maybe it's Black Flash disguising, I don't know. Either way, this version of Wally absolutely rips through the entire Flash family feeding on their psychic forms and honestly, that's enough for me to put it on this list. So uh, just cause like I don't want it to happen to me. And it's six, Kid Flash. 
In season three of The Flash, Barry kind of gave up on his responsibilities because he was scared of losing Iris. Like, I, I get it, the girl you've been pining after for years had finally admitted that she had feelings for you, but then you went and changed the timeline, so losing her would definitely end up sucking. But you don't give all the responsibility of saving her to her little brother that Godspeed because you changed the timeline. Damn, season 3 was weird. However, in season 3, episode 12, Barry and Wally have a race to keep Wally's training going. Things seem fairly even until they come to a building that they need to run over. Barry faces through the wall, but since Wally doesn't know how to do that, he has to run over the building. Funny. <laughs> Wally has to run over a wall. Wally, wall. Either way, Barry ends up winning and Wally complains because he phased. But then Barry responds with the best line of, what's my name? Since prior, he was mentioning how he was called the fastest man alive. Also, I want to just say that they were betting on this race and Caitlyn bet more on Barry than Iris did. So, uh, maybe I should have let Savitar win. Just saying. Halfway through into number five, Black Lightning. The Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover event was probably the biggest, most influential event the Arrowverse ever had, similar to how Crisis on Infinite Earths in the comics was a really big event. With characters from shows that we didn't even know were in the Arrowverse making an appearance, like Doom Patrol, Teen Titans, and even Ezra Miller's Flash. However, one of the most highly anticipated crossovers was Black Lightning, who made his appearance after being pulled to Earth 1 by Pariah when his Earth was destroyed in Part 3 of the 5 part crossover. His first meeting with the heroes was an eventful one though, attacking Vibe, Frost, and the Flash at the Antimatter Cannon, demanding that he be sent home, even though there was no home to be sent home to. After some quick descriptions about what's going on from Pariah and Barry he calms down. But before he does he takes a few passes at the Flash, including just throwing lightning at him, which Barry just blocks with some additional lightning. So, pretty sick if you ask me. And for Supergirl. Okay, this is the last of the Arrowverse stuff, I promise, okay? Just, he fights a lot of people in the Arrowverse. The Invasion crossover was the first big crossover the Arrowverse had. They had a couple prior to this, but this was the first one where Supergirl was brought in to Earth-1, and since the Legends were having their first season, they were also there as well. However, after discovering that Barry had changed the timeline and made a whole new reality that gave Diggle a son and killed Sisko's brother, the group basically benched Barry when they were going to save the president from aliens. Yeah, bench the guy who can run at the speed of light. That's a great idea. So since Barry was staying, Oliver stayed back with him. But it's actually a good thing that they did because the distress signal turned out to be a trap that everyone went to because, you know, they were trying to save the president. However, they turned against Oliver and Barry because they got brainwashed by Dominators. So in an attempt to get the Dominators out of the other's heads, Barry lured Supergirl to a warehouse where he got her really mad, mad enough to break the connection. He got her mad by showing her how much faster he is and that she couldn't even lay a finger on him. I actually like find it funny because it's such a, like a childish thing, but it works so well. Getting close to the end in a number three, Batman. Batman is always depicted as a hero who can beat anyone despite not having any powers. And I get why it's appealing to people. Because we all want to feel like we can do anything, even though we're not a superhero. But the thing is, this whole Batman is the best thing is a lot of bull, okay? Take this single frame from the Price storyline, where Flash puts his fist not even a centimeter away from Batman's face and says, I could hit you a hundred times before you even threw one punch. And he is absolutely right. I love this line. I love Batman being put in his place. Not only that, but as Red Death, Barry was also able to beat Batman after being blasted with positive energy. God, that sounds like the show. Barry was able to take control over his body again as Red Death since Batman was so full of hate and whatnot. Cause you know, Red Death is a combination of Bruce Wayne and Barry when they combined after entering the Speed Force while Barry was tied to the front of a cosmic treadmill powered Batmobile. I'm not even kidding. It sounds absolutely ridiculous. Penultimately, in a number two, Quicksilver. During the Marvel vs. DC crossover comic event, The Flash was pitted against Quicksilver, since he's the Marvel equivalent. However, there are multiple things about these characters that separate them. For instance, Quicksilver's body is always moving quickly, and he has to actually slow himself down in order to talk to people and live like a normal person would, which is why he comes off as short-tempered and easily annoyed, because he's literally slowing down his life for you and can't wait for you to get in the fast lane. However, The Flash and subsequently other DC speedsters only run fast when accessing the speed force, so otherwise they're just normal people with high metabolisms. But when pitted against each other, the Flash did understandably come out on top, because while he needs to access the speed force to move fast, he's accessing a literal force of nature. So 
yeah, it, it makes sense. Finally, in at number one, Superman. The Flash beats Superman in one of the most iconic moments of all time in comics. The Flash and Superman have faced off on multiple occasions, multiple of which ended in a tie or close to it. But in the panels of Flash Rebirth number three, we got to see how that was all possible. After all, Barry is accessing a force of nature. When Barry wanted to re-enter the Speed Force after escaping, the Justice League was looking for a way to disconnect Barry from the Speed Force to save his life. But Barry manages to break free and and runs off. Superman follows him though, saying that he will find a way to save him and that they can't lose another hero, and that he won't be able to re-enter the Speed Force because he will keep up with him. That they have raced before and Superman even won a couple times. But that's when Barry looks at him super smugly and says, those were for charity Clark, and then BOOM! The man runs insanely fast and leaves Superman in his dust. I love this moment. It settled the debate once and for all. Who's faster? The Flash. By far. I love it. Best moment in all of comics, okay? Well, I mean, after the introduction of Green Arrow's son. Kicking off the list at number 10, Superman. We'll kick off the list with some mind-controlled madness here. We always love those. In part one of the Superman sacrifice storyline, Maxwell Lord had Superman thinking he was fighting Doomsday, but in reality he was fighting his own friend, Diana Prince. Now Superman does seem to do most of the damage here, but only because Diana was strategically using her lasso against him in hopes to cancel out the mind control. She had her wrist broken during this altercation, but eventually she realized the only way to stop Superman was to take out Maxwell Lord instead. But if she had not taken down Maxwell, she for sure would have won against mind controlled, dare I say, messy Superman. She slashed his throat at one point and was still holding back. What a ride. Number 9. Green Lantern Hal Jordan is one of the most powerful members of the Justice League. His ring allows him to get a lot done, but how does it hold up against the might of Wonder Woman? In the New 52, the team aren't exactly close yet. They have their arguments, you know, it's realistic. They didn't know each other too well, so it makes sense. But in Justice League issue 11, Wonder Woman sets out to take on David Graves. Steve Trevor is there and Diana plans on taking off Graves' head. So Green Lantern steps in with other ideas. He insists that this is a job for the League and not just for her, so she should back down or at least include them. She says no to both options. So Green Lantern uses his ring to hold her back, and after Diana demands to be let out, he responds with no. So she breaks out of the ring's construct and throws Green Lantern around for a few pages. She actually tries to use her sword on him at one point, believe it or not, but luckily Superman grabbed it mid-swing. That was a close call, Diana. A little too close for comfort. And before we continue with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It really does help us out here on our channel, and then in turn we can bring you all the nerdy goodness and put it back into your eyes. Thank you so much for your support. Now let's get right back to this list. Number 8, Power Girl. In Wonder Woman issue 41, A Murder of Crows, part 2, we see Power Girl and Wonder Woman go toe to toe. This nightmare becomes reality when the son of Ares, the Crows, turns superheroes against Wonder Woman, including Power Girl. At the start of the comic, Wonder Woman even acknowledges that this isn't going the way she thought it was. She's getting quite a few hits from Power Girl. Now, it's fun to watch. I mean, Power Girl literally punches Diana so hard that she ends up in Canada, which is amazing. Karens are tough. She's probably the toughest Karen out there. I would say so. But Wonder Woman quickly reminds herself that she too has super speed. She's good, but she's no Amazon. Number 7. Supergirl Hell on Earth is a Superman storyline beginning with Superman Volume 3, Issue 13. And as the title suggests, Hellspawn arrives to Earth and kicks Superboy and Superman out of the Fortress of Solitude, so now they need help from the Justice League in stopping him. Hell's idea here is to go back in time and prevent the destruction of Krypton, but in order to do so, our solar system will be blown to smithereens. Nice. Hashtag not so great. Supergirl is on board with Hell's plan to, you know, bring back Krypton, so Wonder Woman knows that she must stop her. Diana reminds her that strength is not simply about force, but rather from studying your opponent and how they fight. She continues to tell Kara that she fights like a child, wasting energy and lashing out. That's a pretty harsh burn. So Diana ties her up then with a lasso and hopes that Supergirl can learn from this. Closely matched in strength and speed, but not experience. Number six, Batman. On screen, we saw Batman and Superman go at it. It was a good time, but we have yet to see Batman fight Wonder Woman, and that's probably for the best. In Wonder Woman, the Heikatia, released in 2002, during this storyline, Batman gets on Diana's radar after somebody Wonder Woman was in charge of protecting turns out to be a criminal in Gotham City. So Batman has a few choice words to say. That's his city, and he handles the crime around those parts. Diana disagrees, so now we get a heated exchange 
exchange. Lucky for us, it's pretty epic. Batman throws a batarang and Diana catches it. It's always an entertaining dynamic when two superheroes have different plans. Now the only way for Diana to stop beating down Bruce was for Batman to tell her that she straight up won. He surrenders, which is insane. The cover of the story is actually pretty spoilery. It shows Wonder Woman's foot on Batman's head, which we don't see play out until page 93. But it's still worth the read nonetheless. Check it out. Number five, The Punisher. I would pay thousands of dollars to see this on screen. No problem, debit, boop. Punisher Batman Deadly Knights, written by Chuck Dixon. We get to see John Romita Jr. draw Batman during his 37 years at Marvel Comics, which is amazing. So both of these heroes were on the same side, more or less. They wanted bad guys off the street, but the way that Frank Castle does that, by spraying, you know, plethora of bullets, Batman likes to break an arm or two, so they're a little bit different. So they get into a disagreement over Batman's one rule, and Frank is moments away from taking out the Joker, and then Batman intervenes and saves the Joker's life, which is kind of crazy. Batman lets Frank connect one hit to the face because he was frustrated, but one is all he'll get tonight. Number four, Captain Adam. In Injustice Gods Among Us issue two, Captain Adam is keeping Superman busy. He's holding the god down by using his nuclear energy. And he's actually doing a pretty decent job here, I'm not gonna lie. The Pentagon thinks that Nathaniel can take Superman on, but he's never tried to before until now because he knows, you know, he follows orders, unlike some other gods. It's a heated exchange, but it comes to an explosive halt once Diana enters the scene. Right before Captain Adam is about to punch Superman's head right off, Wonder Woman uses her sword to slash at his throat. He's standing there afterwards, but everybody knows what's about to happen. He has more power in him than 10 nuclear bombs, and her magic sword just breached the one thing that contains it. So he decides to take Superman with him as he flies off and explodes in space. Number three, Huntress. Back to the Injustice timeline yet again. Looking into year three, issue 21, the world is far from bright. Superman is hurt, so Huntress believes that this is the perfect time to take a crack at the son of Krypton. Batwoman is also there, so the two of them perform a well choreographed cranial kick and down he goes. They genuinely have him on the ropes here. It's looking good, but then in comes the bestie Wonder Woman. Not on her watch, oh god. Diane explains how fighting for a lost cause doesn't make you a hero, it just makes you foolish. Huntress responds with, well we'd rather die fools than belong to a tyrant, and then Diana makes that a reality by cracking her whip around Huntress's neck and giving a mighty tug. She got Gwen stacy by Wonder Woman, guys, that's brutal. She says she didn't mean to, but at that point it's... It's far too late, doesn't matter. Number two, the Justice League. Perhaps one of the best victories here has to be the time Diana blindfolded herself in order to take on Medusa. Yeah, you heard me. Shut your eyes for this one, folks. This one goes down to Wonder Woman Eyes of the Gorgon, beginning in Wonder Woman Volume 2, Issue 206. Diana is challenged to take on Snakehead Sally over here, so at first, she blindfolds herself, obviously. But when the blindfold comes off, she needs a new plan, so she improvises and uses one of the snakes from her head that had been severed off, and she uses its venom to blind herself. That's one way of not looking. She takes down Medusa blind. It's actually really impressive, but it only gets better. A couple of issues later, Diana, still blind, begins training with the Justice League. They need to know she's still a formidable member, so like the final scene of Dodgeball, she wraps up her eyes, and so it begins. Plastic Man, The Flash, Black Canary, Martian Manhunter, even Batman comes in at one point, all racing towards her, and she takes them all on. Superman even fires a gun at her, like, okay, but she deflects it, no sweat, still blind. How impressive is that? And finally, coming in at number one, the Justice League, again. Another one, here you go. Yeah, it's pretty common for superheroes to think about taking down their own teammates. Batman did it in Tower of Babel. He had all these plans in case, just in case anybody on the team went a little psycho. And then in JLA, A League of One, Diana has to face a similar situation. The story begins with a flashback to 1348, where the evil dragon, Dracul Carfang, has started wiping out villages. Now the only way to destroy said dragon is of course to get to its heart, how soft and lovely. Soldiers reach the dragon's lair fail at killing it, obviously, so then they just blow the entrance apart and seal it in forever. Until, you guessed it, today, present day. So the rules with how to defeat this dragon are complicated because it can only be taken down by members of the Justice League, but in turn, it would take them out in the process. So Diana figures out this wild loophole and takes the team down herself in order to protect them. Yeah, hear me out. She traps Martian Manhunter in a volcano. She throws Aquaman to the fishes, hilariously. He gets eaten by a sea monster. And then she beats up Batman and the Flash. She also steals Green Lantern's ring, which is just rude. She handles Superman as well by sending him away on a fake mission in space, so he's just away, not even involved. And then she handles the dragon with her lasso, almost dying in the process, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Even if that includes throwing your coworker into a sea monster's trout. What can I say? That's 
That's teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. Number 10, Jason Todd's worst fear. Probably one of the most heartbreaking moments for me in recent years in terms of DC Comics happened during Three Jokers, Batman Three Jokers, so pretty recently. I'm still not really sure why people don't like this comic. I thought the story by Jeff Johns and artist Jason Fabic was well worth the multi year wait myself. It was suspenseful, it was mysterious, and it was just stunning. And honestly, every time I go back to it, I find something new that I like about it. Sure, the middle act in issue number two lagged a bit, but otherwise, this comic to me was pretty flawless, other than a few minor plot hole issues, in my opinion. Also, the raccoon. Oh! And despite the lag in issue number two, it still had one of the most heartbreaking moments for me, which occurred when Jason as Red Hood chose to strike out on his own and ended up finding a pool filled with failed attempts at creating the next Joker, which in and of itself is another kind of brutal. At one point, the three Jokers implied that Jason actually might be the best candidate to become the next Joker, but decide that he's simply not smart enough to take up the mantle. Ouch. Instead, they once more beat him to within an inch of his life with a crowbar with one of the Jokers. Jokers, implied to be the Joker who first did this to Jason way back when, commenting on how the second time was even more fun than the first. It gets especially brutal and heart wrenching when Batgirl and Batman arrive on the scene to rescue him and he lashes out at them. Especially when, like, Babs just comes in and gives him a hug and she's like, I just want to make sure you're safe. Number nine, The Dark Knight Strikes Again. Batman The Dark Knight Returns came to us originally as a way to give Batman, Bruce Wayne, a fitting end. And it's easily one of the greatest Batman stories out there with Frank Miller art that was actually understandable and a great tale that wrapped up the character of Batman in a lovely little bow. But then, Frank Miller went and created two sequels, and the first of which is basically a fever dream of insanity, overly objectified blocky cartoon women, and just odd visuals, while also taking the character of Superman and completely misunderstanding and disrespecting him. But I think the most egregious moment came when Supes and the third member of the Trinity, Wonder Woman, decided they were going to hook up right after Batman beat the absolute snot out of the Man of Steel. Wonder Woman comes in to find Superman completely beaten and bloody and ranting about how it's all over, and then, after punching him for being weak, I guess, they immediately start making out. Then they fly up into the stratosphere and begin going at it midair, and then slamming into the ground causing volcanic eruptions, massive earthquakes, and tsunamis, hurricane level winds, all for Wonder Woman to say he moved the earth for her. Wow, so poetic. And then she exclaims she is pregnant now and they decide to get a bite to eat, but they sure are heroic. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. Helps us out, helps you to stay in the know. It's a win-win. Click the subscribe button. Do it, God. Number eight, Black Canary. Although Black Canary ultimately prevents the fight from coming to a close in the Injustice universe, Harley is definitely about to win when this happens and would have been crowned victor. I mean, after all, she is mid swing with her hammer just coming down almost on Black Canary's head there. However, Black Canary at the moment of her demise halts the fight as she's about to be sick to her stomach. Harley, recognizing Black Canary's morning sickness as a symptom of her being pregnant, decides to call the whole thing off, refusing to fight someone who is pregnant due to her own history. Although a moment ago, Harley was ready to smash Black Canary's head in with her giant hammer. Now the two women bond over their shared experience. It turns out that while Black Canary is pregnant with the now deceased Green Arrow's child, Harley was once pregnant and gave birth to the Joker's child in secret. Honestly, this is like a really fun fight that also just turns into like a really heartfelt moment, which is kind of great. Number seven, Jericho versus Vigilante. Okay, so I did talk about this one for brutal villain defeats, but I had no idea this moment happened before, so if we're talking about brutal DC moments we never saw coming, this one for sure hits the mark for me. Joey Wilson, aka Jericho, is the son of the infamous assassin Deathstroke the Destroyer. But despite that fact, Jericho made almost every effort to be a hero, and he was one. He was even a member of the Teen Titans, the team that consistently stands against his own dad. Now Jericho has the ability, granted to him, him by the same method that granted his dad his abilities to transfer his consciousness into the body of another using eye contact and take control of them, effectively possessing them. And it was pretty powerful. He could control some pretty strong beings. Unfortunately, every time he did this, a small shred of the individual psyche remained in his head. At first, it was nothing that he couldn't deal with, just one or two psyches. But over time, possessing multiple people, he had so many psyches floating through his head that it drove him insane. Now, the rogue anti hero. 
hero known as Vigilante took on the responsibility of stopping Jericho. And where Vigilante originally planned to just go the quick route and completely end Jericho, Jericho's sister stood firm that her brother was a good person at heart and should not lose his life. Vigilante heard her out and decided to not deal with this threat in a lethal way. Instead, after Jericho was captured and in the back of a police vehicle, Vigilante paid the guy a visit and just completely took Jericho's eyes from his head. It eliminated the threat of Jericho's powers, sure, but I can probably think of a dozen different ways that this course of action could have been averted. Number 6. Joker's Payback Seriously? The Joker? I mean, what is wrong with this guy? Another horrible moment that haunts me. In fact, this whole story haunts me, not just this one moment, which comes from Brian Azzarello's The Joker. This story follows Johnny Frost, who was tasked with going to pick up the Joker after he's been released from prison. Finally out of the clink, Joker returns to check up on some old friends and old businesses. One of his first stops is a bar, and business where Harley Quinn has been dancing while he was away. Not appreciating that Harley has gotten involved in this kind of business, Joker decides to take it out on the man running the establishment by skinning him alive, much to Frost's horror. Although to be honest, this is really only the beginning and things only get much, much worse from there, especially from Johnny's perspective. Number 5. Abandoned at the Altar The wedding of Batman and Catwoman was a big freaking deal. It was teased at and built up for a long time. Fans were genuinely excited to see it happen and to see what could come next after the fact. A kid of Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne, what would that be like? We've seen futures where they end up together, but sadly, the wedding that was so coveted never came to be. Batman issue 50 came and went, and following suit, so did Catwoman, came and went from Bruce's life, literally leaving the groom at the altar. Not like permanently leaving his life, but kind of. Batman was marrying Catwoman so he could literally be happy, and after some convincing words from criminals like the Joker and her friend Holly, Catwoman believed that if Bruce Wayne was happy, then Batman couldn't be Batman, which one, that's depressing as hell, but two, both the Joker and Holly, alongside Riddler, Gotham Girl, Flashpoint, Thomas Wayne, Batman, and other villains were working for Bane, who was manipulating events in order to break Batman emotionally and give rise to the City of Bane event. Well, it certainly sent Batman down a path of absolute despair. He became much more drastic with his fighting of criminals, particularly an innocent Mr. Freeze, and he even donned a less advanced version of his bat suit so that he would take more of a beating. Like, come on! Guy's been through enough. Number four, the non-canonical made canon. One of the weirdest things with DC is how sometimes they just completely leave their stories open to be in canon or not, kind of depending on how they're received by fans. And one of the weirdest incidents of this happening is with the Killing Joke. The Killing Joke, written by Alan Moore, was never intended by him to be part of the main continuity. And as far as I know, it kind of isn't really, except for one part of the story: the attack on Barbara Gordon, the pain she suffered, and the result of that. That attack, her becoming paralyzed from the waist down. Why this was the only thing we chose to keep from this story, I do not know. But the whole idea of it just feels super weird, especially when you consider how brutal and graphic this attack was, where Barbara gets no opportunity to defend herself, having been surprised by the Joker's visit while visiting her dad in her civilian form. This element of the story would change Barbara's life forever. And although I do like Babs as Oracle, and I feel like we're able to actually at least turn it is something good. It feels like she was kind of robbed of, you know, some agency here. Especially when you consider the story was never really intended to be incorporated into the canon. And it also still kind of wasn't. Number 3. Maxwell Lord and Ted Cord. I made a rhyme. I think we can all agree that it's incredibly rare to see a mainline superhero taken out of the picture. And if it does happen, it's usually in a huge blaze of glory or an incredibly tragic moment or after a long momentous battle with cancer in the case of Marvel's Marvel. So, when when Ted Cord was erased from existence thanks to a bullet from a barrel at the hands of Maxwell Lord in the countdown to Infinite Crisis, it kinda sucked. After following Ted the whole book as he struggles for anyone in the Justice League to take him seriously, while he's correctly on the trail of Maxwell and learning of all his misuse of both the Justice League's files, Batman's Brother Eye satellite, and the Omax, you'd expect Cord to come out surviving, having a cathartic moment where he finally gets the League's respect or to make a dent in Lord's plans, but instead Instead, he gets snuffed out like a tea light candle that never even begun to make the wax melt. It's abrupt, brutal, and it made me legitimately very sad to read it. Number 2. Face Off One of the most brutal moments that still haunts me to this day, of course, involves 
the Joker. Because of course he's one of the most twisted and often brutal characters that we have over at DC, I would say. This one comes to us from around the time of Death of the Family. In this story, Joker ended up removing his face in order to reinvent himself. Needless to say, this didn't last forever, but it was a terrifying time. And honestly, I'm not sure how Joker lived after doing this, considering that I'm pretty sure he would have been opening himself up to all kinds of like nasty infections. Despite removing his face, Joker would later recover and somehow reapply said face. Despite the fact that the face was not well stored in between, cause comics I guess. Ugh. Number 1. Fridged This DC Comics brutal moment caused the whole coining of a term and changed the way comic books were written going forward. Green Lantern Kyle Rayner came home one day after doing his superhero thing in Green Lantern issue number 54 from 1994 to find his then girlfriend, photojournalist Alexandra DeWitt, had been very savagely stripped of her life at the hands of the villain known as Major Force. But not only did Major Force take Alexandra's life, but for seemingly no reason he also stuffed her into the couple's fridge. It was incredibly brutal and served only to give Kyle, the male antagonist of the story, the motivation to reach new heights as a hero while her character, who was genuinely likable and could stand on her own, was gone forever. This was a trope in not only comics but media in general that presented viewers and readers with the idea of sacrificing the female love interest for the direct purpose of motivating the male hero, which practically never happened in the reverse. After this comic came out, the trope was finally given a name, Fridging, or Women in Refrigerators, and it changed the way female characters were written in comics for the most part. And it changed the way female characters were written in comics for the most part going forward. B R U T A L. Brutal! That's what you just saw. But now it is the end. Yup. Thanks you guys so much for watching. I've been Adam Mangers. And I'm Amanda McKnight, and this has been Top 10 Nerd. Stay nerdy, YouTube. Peace!